Hello, everyone. Welcome back to This Redeemed Life with Marion Jordan Ellis. And I'm very excited to continue diving into Mark chapter eight with you guys today. But before we do so, I just want to say hello and give a shout out to our ministry partners. If you don't know, uh, This Redeemed Life is a listener supported podcast. And that means uh, we have friends and family and people across the globe who are just uh, giving on a monthly basis to make this podcast uh, that teaches God's word, that hopefully equips you uh, to live for his glory and to stand in the face of a world that is uh, opposed to Christ. Um, so if you would like to join our partnership team, you can go to thisredeemlife.org and just click on donate. And we would love to have you a part of what we believe God is doing across the globe. I want to tell you about another thing exciting this month. I have a Bible study coming out. It's on the gospel of John and it's called behold and believe. And it's an eight week uh, study. You're going to go verse by verse through the gospel of John. And it has nine teaching videos, which are included with the workbook. You can find that on Amazon or Barnes or really wherever you get your books. And so it's on pre-order right now. And I would love it if you guys would go and pre-order that. It is perfect for groups. It's perfect for churches. Uh, there are small group questions included. And really um, just everything I love about Jesus. Um, in the Gospel of John, we just get to see God's glory. We get to see um, the redemption story. So this Bible study is um, really designed for those of you who are maybe new to the faith, or you are a seasoned believer, and it's just going to take you deeper and deeper into beholding the glory of God. So without further ado, let's dive into Mark chapter eight. And as I really just studied this passage, um, the thing that struck me most is how confident Jesus is and who he is. I say that because I was telling a friend recently, one of my favorite things about getting older is how less concerned I am about the opinions of others. And I don't mean that in a callous way. I just mean that like when you're in high school or you're in your early 20s, really the opinions of people are so important. You're very, uh, not everyone, but there's just a, a level of insecurity that happens when you're younger. But as you get older uh, and mature, it's just like people just they their opinions are just not as important anymore um but a lot of that for me has had because of christ and i would say if not for christ i would still be enslaved to the opinions of people um I've, i like to say when we know we know who we are when we know whose we are uh, by that when i understand truly that says that I have been bought with a price, that Jesus paid the ultimate price for me. Value before God. And then when I understand that I'm a child of God, that I have a purpose in this world, that defines my identity, that who I am. And it all comes back from whose I am. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus. Jesus was not ruffled by people who questioned his identity or questioned his authority because he knew he came from heaven to earth. He knew he was the son of God. He understood two things. He understood his identity and he understood his mission. And that is really what we're going to look at today in this section of Mark. Mark, because Mark is teaching us that Jesus is the King of glory who's come to bring the kingdom of God. And in that, Jesus has really um, identified himself through these signs and wonders and through his own teaching. And he is really not struggling with an identity crisis. He knows who he is. And um, he knows that his mission is is that he is the Messiah. Now, that is a biblical term that I just want to unpack for a second. The word Messiah um, comes from the word in Hebrew that means anointed one. Now, in the Old Testament, there were three groups of people that were anointed by God for the mission or what they came to accomplish. And those were the prophets, as in Elijah was anointed by God, the priest, if you think about in um, Leviticus or Exodus, how uh, the tribe, the Levites, uh, descendants of Aaron were anointed 
for the priesthood. And you also have the kings. You have um, like King David was anointed to be the king of Israel. Now in the person of the Messiah, what God kept uh, prophesying throughout the Old Testament that one was coming who would hold all three of these offices, prophet, priest, and king. He would be anointed by God, which is means he would be, uh, the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon him for this role of Messiah, which means the deliverer, the one who's coming to bring the redemption promised by God and to be the one who would be um, bringing people back to God. And so uh, there was an expectation in the people for the Messiah. They were looking for him and they're asking about him. And so Jesus was very confident that number one, he was the son of God. And number two, that he came as the Messiah. So when we say Jesus Christ, it's important for us to understand that Christ was not his last name. Christ is the Greek term Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew term. The word Christ is the Greek translation of that. So when we say we're saying Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one who came from God to deliver and to bring us back to him. So where we pick up in Mark chapter eight, this whole identity and mission of Jesus is very crucial. Mark eight, I'm going to pick up in verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus lays, laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Then it just shows us Jesus taking this blind man by the hand and personally leading him out of the village. I believe that Jesus didn't want this man to be a spectacle. He wanted to uh, guard him from shame. He wanted to honor his dignity, but also Jesus wasn't there to be a circus act. He wasn't there to just um, perform these miracles to entertain people. He was truly there and in compassion for this man who suffered from blindness, he was going to heal him. Now, there's a reason Mark shares this miracle because there are tons of miracles that happen that were not shared. We are, we're told that in many of the gospels, but this miracle is very specific because it's one of the identification marks of the Messiah. So in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 35 says, the eyes of the blind will be open and their, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. So that was a problem prophecy concerning, hey, this is going to, this is how you know that the Messiah is in your midst. The blind will see, the, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. So, so far in the gospel of Mark, check, 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 check. We've seen Jesus do all, literally every one of these things he has performed as a miracle in front of his disciples and in front of the crowds and even in front of the skeptics who do not believe in him, that he has made the blind to see and the lame to walk and the, the mute uh, to talk and the, the deaf to hear. That's, that's what he did. And proving that, yes, he claimed this, but he is showing through his signs and wonders that he is the Messiah. If you'll recall in Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, when John the Baptist is in prison and he is struggling and he's having some doubts, he sends his disciples to Jesus and saying, are you the one that we've been expecting? Are you the promised Messiah? Are you the one that uh, we were told would come? And in response to that, Jesus said, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. He gives the, the list of all the things that the prophet said he would do and that he had done. Now, here we come to the point that Jesus is going to take the disciples away to a place. Um, and in Mark 8, 27 to 30, we have what I call the pop quiz. 
Uh, if you remember being in school, or maybe you are in school, uh, you showed up to class and you were not expecting the teacher to say, take out a number two pencil, we are going to have a test. You were not prepared for this, but all the same, your calculus teacher, your history teacher, your English teacher, they popped a test on you. Well, this is what happened with Jesus and the disciples. Jesus takes uh, them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, I've been to Israel se several times. Uh, there's Caesarea by the sea, and there's also a place called Caesarea Philippi. By the name Caesarea, what that tells you, this place was built in uh, memory of, or to honor, or to worship the Caesar. Now, remember, in Roman times, they had come to see the Caesar or the emperor or the king as a god. And so Caesarea Philippi was, um, it was a pagan worship site. And in multiple ways, this is a place where not only was it deifying the Caesar, but also it was a place where Pan, one of the Roman gods was worshiped. And I've been to the spot many times and I would love the next time I take a tour of Israel, if you wanna come with me, there are, there are places where you can see uh, in the rock where they would put the statues and representatives of their Roman gods, uh, what they believed were uh, these idols that they, they actually worshiped. And so, Jesus takes his disciples here to this, why, you ask, would he go to this pagan shrine, this pagan place that was filled with all of this mystery and symbolism and witchcraft? And it's like, Jesus, you don't belong there. He takes them there intentionally because he asks an incredible question. And this is the question. I want you to see it in Mark 8, verse 20. 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say? And they told him, well, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Remember, we said that is the word Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now, here's the pop quiz. They're standing literally in front of the world's options of what to worship. Worship yourself. Worship something you've made by your hands. Worship the government. Worship this guy named Caesar who thinks he's God. We have, every one of us have so many options of who or what we will worship. And Jesus stands his disciples in front of the world's options and says, who do you say I am? Who do people think I am? And so the, the disciples were like, you know, some people think you're one of the prophets from a long time ago. Some people think you are John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. And he's like, I don't want to know what other people think. I want to know what you think. And I, I believe there's a point that every single person answers this question, who is Jesus? And Peter gives the right answer. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And in Matthew's translation, or Matthew's um, telling of this account, he goes on to say, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And, um, and Peter got it right. And there in front of the options at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus affirmed, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. This is the mission for which I came. So on the heels of, of Peter, just getting us on this quiz of answering correctly, who is Jesus? Here's what Jesus teaches them. Mark 8, verse 31. He began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Paul's right there. And we'll pick up it. First, called himself the son of man. If you'll go back a few episodes, we talked about the son of man being one of the key messianic titles from the Old Testament about the Messiah. And Jesus takes that upon himself. And then from the scripture, from the Old Testament, Jesus tells his disciples that 
the son of man, the Messiah must suffer, must die, but he will be raised from the dead. So he uses the Old Testament to tell people, to tell his disciples who he is. Now there's people today who will say, well, the Old Testament doesn't matter. All of that is gone. We're under the new. Well, Jesus said that it mattered a lot because not only did he come to fulfill it, he did, he also says that it all pointed to him. So we just can't write off the Old Testament just because we're now under the new covenant. Jesus himself validated and used it to base his identity. So picking up at verse 32, and he said this plainly, and then Peter, remember Peter who just passed the test? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, okay. Just cannot imagine, but he did. Peter, bold Peter, looks at Jesus and rebuked him. Verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Oh, oh gosh. So here's what we've learned. Peter got it right. And then he got it very, very wrong. Peter was right about Jesus's, but he was completely wrong about Jesus's mission. He was right about Jesus being the Messiah, but Peter was wrong about what the Messiah came to do. Peter was thinking based on the agenda of the world, not based on the agenda of the kingdom of God. You see, the culture of Peter's day wanted a Messiah who was gonna come in kick down the doors, beat up Rome, and establish the throne again in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus did come to defeat our enemies, but he came to defeat a spiritual enemy and to kick down the doors of sin and death. He did not come to defeat an earthly Caesar. He came to defeat Satan. Can I get a witness, somebody? So Peter has in mind the things of man. He does not have in mind the things of God. And so he had the audacity to rebuke Jesus, the one he just called the Messiah to his face, and Jesus turned around real quick and said, get behind me, Satan. Why? Satan did not want Jesus to go to the cross. Satan did not want Jesus to pay for the sin of the world. Satan did not want Jesus to fulfill the ministry of the kingdom, so he used one of Jesus' own to try to talk him out of it. Our culture, there are so many people, they get it right by, about the identity of Jesus, but they get it wrong about the ministry of Jesus. They get it wrong about the mission of Jesus. Uh, there are people who will gladly say Jesus is God, that Jesus came in the flesh, died for our sin, and was resurrected. They, got, they get those things right, but here's what they're going to get wrong. They're going to get wrong their belief about sin, about repentance and about what Jesus calls us to do. We have to be aware, just as Peter, who is going to be completely redeemed and uh, he's going to get it right eventually, just as Jesus had to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan, there are teachers right now in our churches, in our world, who are speaking according to the agenda of the world about Jesus, but this is not what Jesus would stand for. Their Jesus does not confront sin. Their Jesus does not call for repentance. Their Jesus does not expect you to take up a cross and follow him. And that means they have a right identity of who Jesus is, but they do not understand the call, the ministry, and the purpose of Christ. Their Jesus is not the God of the Bible. And like Peter, Jesus had to explain to Peter, hey, this is what is written of me in the scriptures that the prophet said I was going to suffer, I was going to die, but I was going to be resurrected. So when Peter said, hey, you can't do that, he said, get behind me, Satan, because you're calling the word of God a lie. And so when you hear people who say God didn't really say this or that, or you hear people saying, well, this is the way Jesus is, and you have like that little catch in your spirit, and you're like, is that really true? Go back to the word, because the only way we can know who Jesus is, is not by the latest TikTok trend or by some Instagram person or some person that says it's okay for you to live however you want. You want to know who Jesus is and what Jesus says? You open the book that Jesus read and the, the book that Jesus 
fulfilled. That's how we know who Jesus is, that he is the king of glory. He is unrivaled. He is holy and good and loving and redeemer. He is all those things, but he said, come and follow me. He said, come, take up your cross and follow me. You know what? When I first um, truly encountered Jesus and I understood hey, I have a choice to make. I can either keep living according to the agenda of the world, or I can follow the one who is my redeemer. It was a battle for my soul, but I had to come to the understanding Jesus is better. And when I died to myself and began to follow him, that's where I experienced life. And let me tell you what Satan does not want anyone to experience, the life that comes from only following God. So how can we know if our view of Jesus and our view of his ministry is right? We have to be in the word. I'm so glad you listened to this podcast. It is not enough. I am so glad you are getting biblical teaching. We have to be people every day who are immersed in scripture. I have seen too many people I love, and that's why I'm so passionate about this. If you're like, why is she preaching? I've seen too many people I love fall away. I've seen too many of my people I love be deceived by the devil, and he has stolen their faith. I cannot say whether or not they are born again. I can tell you what, they are deceived, and they're not walking in truth, and their lives are not bearing fruit, and I, I'm concerned for them. I'm heavily concerned from them. So in lieu of all that, let's le- let's read what Jesus said to Peter and to his disciples after his identity was confirmed, after his ministry mission was confirmed, he said, verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny and take up their cross and follow me. The world's message that says it's all about you, do what you want to do, Jesus is going to forgive you. Absolutely. He is the author of forgiveness and his grace is unbounding. But he calls us in light of that grace and in light of their mercy to lay our lives down and follow him. Verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with his holy angels. I think that last part is what burdens me for um, my generation, the people who I see being deceived by false teachers, is that we're being told we don't have to um, take up our cross and follow Jesus when Jesus himself said that. And we're being told it's okay to be ashamed of Jesus when his teachings don't align with what the culture says with what the culture says about sexuality or identity or anything. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and you deny me, then I will deny you when I come in my glory. And I am burdened for believers who are buying the lie that you can deny Christ in these areas and still be a Christian. It is not my job to judge anyone's salvation, but I am reading the word of God that says we need to take inventory of our hearts. If we fear the world's approval more than we fear standing before a holy God, then we are in trouble. We need to know that the world does not define us. This culture does not tell us who we are. We are defined only by the God who came to redeem us. And we have to align what we believe and how we live with the one who redeemed us. 